Hi and welcome to this uh, video on EMT pharmacology. Um, <clears throat> we're going to jump right into this. As always, disclaimer, not an EMT instructor or clinician. Anything presented here is presented for your own education and you should ultimately validate everything I'm telling you. Things change. I can make mistakes. Ultimately, it's on you to make sure that the information presented is correct and accurate as of the time that you're watching this video. With that, let's get into what we're going to cover today. Um, before we do actually get into the timeline, I do want to talk a little bit about medical terminology. And this is something for those of you that are um, attempting to get your NREMT, uh, pass your exams, um, is one of the biggest things I see people um, kind of screw up, right? Uh, by this point in your EMT training, if you're going through an EMT class and you're now looking at pharmacology, you should really understand medical terminology. Uh, you will not get through this course. Uh, you probably will not pass the NREMT if you do not understand medical terminology. You need to understand um, the different terms used to describe the body uh, for uh, anatomy and physiology. You need to disturb, uh, understand common terms that are used in the medical profession. So if you don't have a good grasp, if you don't know what a penic means, ischemic, if you don't know uh, anterior from um, <clears throat> posterior, if you don't know ventral, dorsal, distal, proximal, if you don't know um, the four quadrants of the heart, you don't know the four quadrants of the uh, abdominal cavity, um, you need to really go back and study that. You're going to get scenarios uh, that are going to use medical terminology at this point in your training it's expected that you understand this. You should, if you are asking an instructor, what does this mean? What does that mean? What's that word mean? You really should take that as a sign that, hey, you've got a gap in your knowledge. And it's important that you understand that you are, you know, it, everybody believes you know this, right? They're going to talk to you in this language. It's kind of like going to another country. And after a period of time that you've been in that country, people are just going to assume you know the language. And if you don't, you're going to have a hard, hard time communicating and getting what you want and being successful. Same thing applies here. So my tip to you is that if you don't understand medical terminology, go back and study it. Try to pick up a few terms every day. Um, it's okay to ask, obviously, but you, you really, at this point in your training, you really need to be concerned if you don't have a strong, strong grasp on medical terminology. In this video and any of the ones that come out after it are going to assume you know medical terminology. They're going to force you um, to, to really either look things up or come to terms with the fact that you have a big knowledge gap and you got to go address that. Um, so um, the reason we're using medical terminology in this video and going forward is to, to again, to, to force you, right, to put you in a position where you have to go look things up. Um, so with that, let's jump into what are we covering here. So we're going to get into uh, EMT pharmacology. Uh, obviously, EMT pharmacology is focused on what you as an EMT can administer in the form of medications to a patient. And, um, you know, it, it's the foundation for if you want to go further in your career to become an uh, advanced EMT or a paramedic uh, or, or other, other positions you may may. Um, you know, pursue, such as a physician assistant, nurse, physician. Um, with that, we're going to get into EMT medications. We're going to get into medication uh, administration. I'm going to give you some key terms and concepts you should know, and then we're going to get into some practice scenarios. So this is a little different order than may be taught in your training. I find this order to be a little bit less confusing for those of you that may be struggling with pharmacology. Um, so we're going to kind of start from a position of, hey, here are the medications you can give what you need to know about those. We're going to break all that down. Then we're going to get into kind of the most important things you need to know before you give an administration, uh, a medication rather. And then again, key terms and concepts, and then give you some scenarios that you can play around with and see how well you're grasping this information. Okay, let's keep going. So, you know, everything in this video, in this uh, presentation, uh, are things that could come up on your test, whether they're a um, skills test or a written. So uh, there's a lot more in your textbook and probably a lot more you're getting in your classes that you also need to know. The focus here is giving you that foundational knowledge that you can use to answer other questions that may not be covered here directly. But everything in here is the foundation and you need to know these three things. 
The three things on this screen are critical for you to know. You need to memorize this because as you get questions that have to do with either um, um, <clears throat> scope of practice or standard of care or medical legal, um, you know, things of that nature, um, you know, <clears throat> negligence, they're going to come back to these. If you know these, you will be able to answer anything related to the topics I just said. Um, it also will allow you to understand what you can and can't do. The first thing is you need to understand medication is an intervention, right? You, you're intervening in the patient. If you could take that and put that in your mind, at any time you give medication, it's because you're trying to do an intervention. What do I mean by intervention? Something's happening with the patient, and you're hoping that the medication you give will prevent that from continuing to occur, okay? Or more importantly, continuing for that patient to deteriorate. So you're, anytime you do any intervention with medication or anything else, you need to understand the goal is to prevent further deterioration of that patient and to hopefully either stop or reverse what is occurring in that patient. And this is pretty serious stuff, and I don't think as EMTs we think we can do these things. But everything we do is an intervention, whether you're giving oxygen, whether you're controlling bleeding, whether you're <clears throat> repositioning a patient so they can breathe better. In this case, though, we are providing medication. The second thing to understand is you have to know your scope of practice. You must know what medications you can and cannot give under what circumstances. We're going to talk a lot about that in this presentation. But why do you need to know it? Scope of practice. What's so important about scope of practice? It comes back to your medical legal knowledge, right? The ability for you to clearly demonstrate and defend <clears throat> your decisions. And all of that will come back to your scope of practice. If you exceed scope of practice, um, then in, in, you're pretty much doing something that's illegal for, for all practical intents and purposes. And, and that's a big problem. Um, the other thing is, if you exceed scope of practice, you could be harming that patient. And now we're into a negligent situation. Uh, and depending on how you do it and what you do, that could either be a civil situation or criminal. The last thing you have to do is understand um, the indications and contraindications. And I'm not going to go deep into any of the medical terminology. I'll give you a little bit of tips here and there. Indications are, you know, what are you observing or, or what signs are you seeing that <clears throat> point you in a direction that you need to intervene? Why would you use this as an intervention? Contraindications or things that tell you you shouldn't do this, right? But why do you need to know these? So you don't bring any harm to your patient, right? And so that you can intervene. Indic ind uh, indications are those things that are going to help you do an intervention, which again means we're trying to stop deterioration of our patient and or reverse the situation in our patient. Um, and then contraindications are, you know, those things that are obviously they're outside our scope of practice. We can't do those things uh, because we're seeing something that's telling us we should perform that action. Okay, so you need to know these. They form the foundation, again, for the knowledge that you can use to help answer questions as part of your NREMT, your skills test, and most importantly, when you actually are doing this to a patient. You know, if somebody's going to give your family member medication, you probably want them to at least know this and then build from here. Okay, let's actually get into the medications. <clears throat> so I'm going to break this down um, in a way that makes sense to me. Hey, if it doesn't make sense to you this way, find a way that makes sense. But I'm trying to take what for many is a really overwhelming topic for some reason uh, and make it as simple as possible, make it bite-sized and kind of crawl, walk, run, okay? So we're going to start with the medications. Again, this is maybe different than it's laid out in your book. Your book probably goes through routes and forms and uh, pharmacology and all of that. Um, we are really focusing on trying to get you through the exam. Uh, and then hopefully give you a set of skills that you can apply in real world situations when you actually get out and practice um, what we're learning here. Okay, first thing, these are the medications that you can administer as of the date of this video. This can change and it also could be impacted by your local protocol. But these are the ones that typically are going to be in the NREMT uh, testing. Whether you are going, uh, whether your local protocol allows you to do it or not, different question. These are the ones that you typically need to know to get through your EMT training classes uh, and eventually take your NREMT. Now, the third one down, this here, I'm going to try and highlight this. Um, this one here, you're, if you say, hey, that's not a medication, you're absolutely right. It's not a medication. <clears throat> so why did I include it in this list? Because you can use this to administer medications like obuterol. But to list all of the different medications that you can do through an MDI or a SVN, um, 
would just make this list a lot larger. And for practical purposes of getting through your exam, you just need to know in your mind that there are things like albuterol or others that are administered through an MDI or SVN that <clears throat> are part of this list. Okay, so from a mental perspective, when you're trying to study and learn this stuff, um, these are basically the medications you can do. You just need to know that MDI and SVN is not a medication, but it represents a class of medications that you give. Okay, hopefully that makes sense, but it's a way to get this into your head and bite size this. All right, <clears throat> so I don't care about these medications right now. We're going to get into each one of them. What you need to also understand is these are the things that you need to know for each medication. Okay, you need to know each of these items. We're going to go into them in a moment. I just need you to kind of keep in mind that there are seven medications. Right? So if you can't memorize these seven medications, one of which is a class of medications administered by MDI SVN, right? So yeah, if you were to write down all the different medications, there'd be more than seven. But to get this in your mind, think about these are the seven. Right? I need to know these things. I need to know aspirin, epinephrine, I need to know the class of MDI SVN medications, naloxone or narcon, <clears throat> nitroglycerin, oral glucose oxygen, right? And for each medication, there are ten things you need to know about them. Okay, <clears throat> now, if you go in the book, there's probably nine, but you need to keep remembering state protocols, right? You have to know your state protocol because the book can tell you to do one thing, and for your NRAMT, you're always going to answer as it is in the book, not as your state protocol. But if you go through your skills test and an instructor asks you for the state protocol, you may have to answer that way to pass the skills test, your, your psychocognitive motor skills. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Whenever you're taking a written, you answer as it is in the book, but when you're involved with someone, uh, you need to ask them, do you want me to answer this based on the state protocol that you're taking a class in or you're practicing, or do you want me to answer this based on the National Registry exam? So that's why we add protocol to this list. Protocol is probably not distinctly called out in the book. It may be referenced or referred to, but we're gonna call it out specifically. Okay, so what are these things that you need to know? What are the 10 things, all right? Uh, first of all, indication, why you're giving it. You know, why do you give this medication? That's it, that's all it is. Contraindication, why don't you give it, okay? Somebody may have chest pain, uh, but they could have an allergy to aspirin, so the contraindication there is don't give it. Contraindications outweigh typically indications. These are things that if they are present, chances are you're not going to give the medication because the contraindication tells you that you're not going to be doing a positive intervention, meaning you're going to probably cause deterioration of your patient. And what don't we want? We're doing this because we don't want the patient to further deteriorate. Okay, interactions. <clears throat> interactions are things you need to evaluate. You need to understand that the patient may be doing something or has done something which could interact with this medication, could ultimately cause some form of patient deterioration or other concern for you. Now, you need to make a judgment call on interactions. You may have an interaction, but the benefit of the medication outweighs the interaction. Okay, so this is where you get to be a big boy and girl and an adult and realize this is real life. You got some serious medic decisions to make. This isn't a game, right? You, you may be giving somebody something uh, like nitroglycerin and you need to understand what those interactions are because they could have done something in the last 24 to 48 hours that causes a serious situation for you. But you may make that decision that you may have to defend in court, right? Because you think that this medication outweighs uh, the, the, the risks of the interactions. Okay, dose, pretty simple. How much are you giving and in what form, okay? Um, <clears throat> so how much is the actual dose of the medication, right? This is going to typically be in milligrams uh, for what we do, but what is the dose? What route? How are you providing this to the patient? What is the way they're going to do it? Are they going to chew it? Are you going to give them an injection? Are you going to <clears throat> have them inhale it? What is the way you're going to administer this? Form. What is the actual form of the medication? Is it a tablet? Is it a liquid? Uh, what is the form? Is it a gel? What are you doing? Um, Okay, action and impact. This is what you're expecting the medication to do. And this is really important. 
I think somewhat more important than anything else. When you're looking, you're evaluating a patient to administer medication, you need to really ask yourself, what is my expected outcome here? What am I expecting this medication to do? Any medication you give is going to have a physiological impact. There's going to be chemical reactions in the body. And so if you have a patient who's providing you symptoms and you're observing signs, then you should know, okay, to deal with that, I need to give this medication. And then hopefully if I give that medication, this is going to be the positive outcome. And then before you give that medication, you go through and determine, are there any contraindications? Am I aware of my interactions? And then that brings us to adverse effects, right? What do we need to monitor, right? What could go wrong by giving this medication that we need to be on the lookout for? So an adverse effect is something that you've decided that the, there is no contraindication, right? There's no reason not to give this. The patient has the appropriate indication. You have reason to give the medication. You are aware of the interactions and have decided that the, interaction, the benefit of the medication outweighs the interaction. You have the right dose, the route, and the form. You understand the action and the impact. So you're going to give that medication. And despite knowing that there could be adverse effects, you're going to still give it. You're going to monitor for those adverse effects. That's critical. As part of your ongoing patient care, you can't just give medication and go, oh, look, they feel better. That's great that they feel better, but are they still having any adverse effects? Because adverse effects can either occur quickly or slowly. So you need to monitor for those adverse effects as you continue to care for that patient until you have a legal and appropriate patient handoff. Uh, and then <clears throat> concerns are just things to generally know about the medication. Things you, they're not truly adverse effects. They're just things you may want to keep in mind as you deal with this patient. And protocol, of, obviously, is your circumstances related on where you're practicing, um, your state protocols, uh, your individual uh, department protocols, whatever it may be. So these are the 10 things that you need to know about each medication. If you don't know these 10 things about each medication, you cannot do what's known as the 9R. We're going to talk about the 9R in a little bit, but I need you to understand if you don't know these, you need to memorize these, right? Like the first thing you should be doing before you go any further in this video is you should have memorized these seven things, just the names, and then these 10 things, right? Because ultimately you need to be able to answer each one of these items in a test, whether it's a verbal test or written. All right, we're gonna go through each one of these really quickly. You can pause the video and you can refer to your text um, to kind of get further details on this. Okay, first of all, aspirin. Typically, primarily going to be given for atraumatic chest pain. What does atraumatic chest pain mean? You should really start understanding the medical terminology, right? Because this is where it is, right? We're at the point now in our training that people aren't gonna be explaining stuff to you. They expect you to understand words. Um, but I'm going to give it to you. Atraumatic just basically means chest pain that comes from not having trauma. You didn't get punched in the chest. You didn't get hit by a baseball bat. You weren't in a car accident. You basically have chest pain and there is no evidence of trauma, right? Patient's telling you I was sleeping. I woke up with this chest pain. You know, the house didn't fall on them. So you can also use aspirin for reducing fever and addressing um, muscle aches or headaches. In most cases, in most jurisdictions, you're not going to give aspirin for that. You might be in a jurisdiction. This is where we get down to protocol. So you need to understand, do we typically in my protocol, my jurisdiction give uh, aspirin for headaches or fever or muscle aches? Now, if you go on the written exam and you're asked, you know, what are the two or three things you could give aspirin for? Well, the right answer to that test question is atraumatic chest pain or chest pain or heart attack or AMI, MI, uh, as well as reducing fever, headaches, or muscle aches. So hopefully you're starting to understand the differences here, but primarily atraumatic chest pain. You get somebody with atraumatic chest pain, no injury of stomach, and the chest pain looks like it's an AMI or MI, you need to go look that up if you don't know what it is, then you're going to give, uh, your indication is to give aspirin as long as there is no contraindication. What is the contraindications? allergies to aspirin, right? Any type of major recent bleeding uh, and or the patient cannot maintain their airway, right? <coughs> the interactions, if the patient's on a blood thinner, anticoagulant, warfarin, Coumadin, uh, Xeralto, uh, you need to 
consider that interaction. This is where you get to make the big girl, big boy decision, right? Are you going to give aspirin even though there may be interaction with anticoagulant? You've got to figure that out and decide is the benefit of the, of the, of the uh, aspirin outweigh the, the potential interaction with an anticoagulant. Um, the dosing, you're going to either give 4 by one, 81 milligrams, which adds up to 324, or you're going to give 1 325. You calculate that dosage over 24 hours. So if the patient said, I already took two 81 um, milligram tablets, then you can only give two more. The total cannot be more than 325 in a 24 to 48 hour period, right? Typically 24 hours. How are you going to give this? PO. You need to go figure out what PO is if you don't know. It's going to be a tablet, and the tablet must be chewed. Uh, it basically the what you're looking for is uh, it's go, aspirin is going to prevent palate, uh, platelets rather from clumping it and reduces inflammation right so those are the actions that you're looking for that's the impact that's what the medication does uh, it can have adverse effects you can get nausea vomiting stomach pain and ultimately the most important one here to know about is anaphylaxis okay um, so this is where the patient has an allergic reaction to the aspirin. Um, you know, if the, so one of the concerns here is if the patient has trauma, you probably don't want to do this or you want to reach out to um, medical control. Um, it has to be chewed. This is critically important. If you don't have the patient sue it, if they have mouth trauma, they have some type of ability, inability to swallow correctly, um, if they're, they're starting to, their level of consciousness isn't there, you're not going to give them aspirin. You're not going to shove it down their throat. Okay, typically if you're giving aspirin for atraumatic chest pain, you're going to call advanced life support. In most cases, when you feel it is necessary to give somebody medication, the answer to your test or your practicals is going to be, I want to call advanced life support. I want advanced life support to be dispatched. Okay, that's aspirin. Um, all right, let's go to epinephrine. This is typically going to be given with an, an anaphylactic reaction or anaphylactic shock, right? The patient is having a reaction to something they ate, absorbed, or came in contact with, um, <clears throat> and you need to give something to counteract to stop that deterioration. I want you to be really clear that this typically involves multiple systems. So if somebody just has hives and they're breathing okay, you're not going to typically inject them with epinephrine. Now if you see hives and they're starting to have uh, issues with breathing, they're starting to have respiratory distress, you probably will give epinephrine. You don't want the patient to further deteriorate. Obviously, if the person has hives and they're having advanced respiratory distress or possibly going into respiratory failure, you will give epinephrine. The point of this is, you know, you need to not be Rambo about this. Evaluate the patient. You're giving a medication. You know, if they're doing okay on their own, they got some hives, they're scratching, maybe their eyes are a little watery, but they have a patent, strong airway, they're communicating with you. There's no signs of respiratory distress. Keep the epinephrine handy and monitor your patient, but don't just go jabbing them, right? Think about what you're doing. And if you are going to jab them and throw on the uh, put epinephrine on board to their system, you better be able to explain why, all right? Um, so contraindications. The reason we don't give epinephrine, atraumatic chest pain. You have a patient with signs of a heart attack, and they're having an allergic reaction, you give them an epinephrine, you, you're going to have a real big problem on your hands. So you need to evaluate the patient and not just jump to the obvious situation. Right? Think about what's going on. Hypothermia and hypotension, high blood pressure, right? hypothermia, patients without obstruction and wheezing. Why? Because if they're not having any kind of chest obst uh, airway obstruction or any kind of wheezing in their lungs, right, then you're not going to give epinephrine. So think about it. If you're evaluating a patient, they have hives, what do you want to do? You want to observe their breathing pattern, their breathing and respiratory rate, and you want to do lung sound oscillation. Are they wheezing? If you got wheezing, then chances are they're going to be getting obstructed very shortly. So yeah, give them epinephrine. I'm hoping you're starting to see how this is some real serious decisions you're making. You're bringing all your skills together, <coughs> and there's no shortcuts here. right? There is no like, oh, you, you came in contact with peanuts and you got a peanut allergy, boom, I'm going to give you epinephrine. you got to stop and ask. Same thing with you know, aspirin, we just covered. You can't just say to somebody, oh, you're having chest pain? I'm going to throw an aspirin down their throat. You know, you got to think about, do they have allergies? Is the chest pain from, from trauma? Is it just, hey, I was working out last night and now I'm really, you know, i got some pain in my chest? Oh, is it sore? Is it radiating? What else are you seeing? Okay, interactions. 
it acts as a basically it affects uh, the the, parasymp uh, the sympathetic nervous system and acts as a uh, stimulus. Three milligram dosage to fifteen milligram uh, point one sorry point three milligrams for adult, point one five for child. It's given IM intramuscular, right? You need to know where to give the in, in, uh, the auto injection. Typically going to be in the thigh, and usually uh, given by a uh, EpiPen. Typically. Um, causes bronchodilation, and we talked about it, it activates the sympathetic nervous system and constricts blood vessels. You need to know that for your test. What does epinephrine do physiologically? Um, you know, adverse effects, uh, nausea, vomiting, <clears throat> um, it doesn't cause anaphylaxis. That's a mistake here uh, in the slides. Uh, your body produces epinephrine, so you, if you're allergic to epinephrine, you've got a bigger problem than, than you giving epinephrine. So look that and confirm that and it's not that's not one of the uh, um, the issues here um, it lasts about five minutes so epinephrine is going to go into the body act very quickly and then wear off very quickly so if you have a patient why do you need to know that that 10 minutes you're in route to the hospital you reevaluate your patient you're reevaluating every five minutes anytime you give medication anytime you give medication the patient is not stable they're an unstable patient that means you reevaluate them every five minutes that's a real key thing to know you can't have a stable patient and give them medication. So if you're giving them medication, they're unstable. And that means a reevaluation every five minutes. Every time you look or consider to give medication. Okay? Little tip there. So here we have a patient. Medication lasts for five minutes. You reevaluate them every five minutes. The second time you reevaluate them, which would be about 10 minutes after administration, patient still is having rapid heart rates. Right? They're still wheezing. <clears throat> Okay, you need to at that point try to start determining is, is the medication causing this or do you have some other issue going on with that patient all right, that you overlooked. So understanding how long the medication is going to last is important because it will give you clues to as to whether or not that patient is uh, experiencing something else or something else started in this patient or the medication is taking longer uh, to actually act. Uh, MDI SVN, right? Typically, we're going to use some type of MDI or SVN <coughs> um, because of asthma or COPD. It's dependent on a specific medication. The contraindications here are dependent on the medication. If you give albuterol, you need to know the uh, contraindications for that. Uh, interactions may impact blood pressure and or cardiac medications. It requires, typically, in most cases, you're going to need to look at the patient's prescription. They're going to have a prescription for what you're giving them and your protocol is going to allow you to assist them with helping do that. It's given usually through inhalation. It dilates the bronchioles. One thing to know, most of these MDI-SVNs are actually epinephrine under the covers. So they're either some type of epinephrine or a synthetic form of epinephrine. So the reaction is going to be very similar to if you gave somebody epinephrine. Um, it dilates the bronchioles, right? Basically, it's going to open up their airways and help them breathe better. Again, this is basically some form of epinephrine or synthetic under the covers of the medication. So you're going to have tachycardia. They're going to be anxiety. There's going to be anxiety. You got to monitor for that and see what's happening. Um, review your local protocols. Right. Typically here, uh, you're going to uh, be assisting the patient because you're assisting. They need to be able to follow commands. Can't give somebody who's unconscious an inhaler. Right, um, can't give an M. Uh, typically, not, well, you can't give an MDI, right? So they have to be a level of conscious has to be such that you can help them, uh, or they can help themselves, right? And you can assist in that. And typically, that's going to be giving them commands of what to do. <clears throat> Opioid overdose with naloxone or Narcon. Um, the big thing to know here is you're going to do this for opiate overdose. You need to know what some opiates are, so you can on your test explain. Patient presents with. Uh, obvious heroin overdose uh, or this family member tells you they have heroin or they've been using heroin uh, they have dilated pupils <coughs> what do you give what do you administer you should know that that's an opioid on the other hand somebody could give you an overdose of cocaine and that's not an opioid so you need to know the differences or at least have some idea uh, typically the contradictions the contraindications are not very high that's gonna be hypersensitivity in most cases, if you have an opiate overdose, you're going to give the medication. Uh, it's known as an opioid antagonist. What is an antagonist? An antagonist blocks something from happening in the body. You need to go look that up. It's a, you need a better definition. I'm not giving you the better definition on purpose, so you go look it up. 
An antagonist blocks something in the body. So basically, it's preventing the opioid in the body from actually carrying out its job, is what naloxone and Narcon do. Single dose inhaler, four milligrams. Auto injector, uh, 0.4 milligrams. Uh, keep that in mind. You also need to know what's in your book. The book, in some in most cases, is a little bit dated on the dosage. So if you're answering this for your written test, look at what the book tells you. Chances are you're going to get that as the right answer. But in the field, when you're actually using Narcon, you need to know that the dosage here on the screen, as of this recording, is the actual dosage. Hopefully you can do that in your head, keep both numbers. I didn't want to put the textbook numbers in here because I thought this, the book may be updated at some point. So check your book so when you do your written, you have the right, the right dosage. But know that as of right now, when this video is posted, that is the actual dosage that you would give a patient. <clears throat> route is going to be either uh, uh, inhaled uh, or through um, intramuscular, right? Uh, single dose, typically uh, inhaler or some type of auto injector. Uh, and basically it just reverses respiratory depression. That's important to know, respiratory depression due to opiate overdose. You can't give this to somebody in respiratory distress um, just for the heck of it. It won't work. It will basically pretty much do nothing, but you would be uh, you would be in a little bit of trouble if you did that, right? So it's um, ultimately used to reverse respiratory depression due to opiate overdose. And again, for your test, you need to know some some opioid examples and uh, make sure that you use those um, to, to only give opioid uh, naloxone for. Person could uh, get nauseous, they could vomit, chances are they're gonna vomit. Um, they have may go into immediate opioid withdrawal symptoms, they may be an addict, and this is blocking the opioids. So they're gonna be really in a lot of pain very quickly, <clears throat> headaches, things like that. You may see them start to sweat, uh, get sh uh, chills, shiver, um, they also may get very violent and angry and combative. Those are the things you need to know. If you have a child less than five years old who comes into contact with opioids, they could live in a household where opioids are being used and they become uh, come in contact with it for some reason, shape, or form. They get into somebody's pain medication. Um, and they're less than five years old, contact medical control is probably the best course of action before you start giving it. Chances are you're going to be told to give it. Um, but you may need to severely uh, adjust the dosage in some way, shape, or form. Nitroglycerin, um, again, this is going to be typically given as an assistant uh, case where you're going to assist the patient. Most uh, squads in the United States that are EMT level, BLS, don't carry nitro. Maybe you do based on your local protocol. Um, but chances are this is going to be, not chances, this is always going to be given for atraumatic chest pain. We've covered that. You should know what atraumatic chest pain is at this point. Real important, big thing for you to know is you cannot do this without having a systolic blood pressure of above 100. It has to be above 100. Um, so you need to get a BP, right? So this is something that's going to come after your primary assessment. Um, if the patient has head trauma, you're not going to give this. Um, so keep this in mind, right? You have a patient who's hit their head during a car accident. Now they're complaining of, of chest pain and uh, the pain's radiating, they're having signs of not just hitting their head, they have a lump, maybe they're bleeding in their head, uh, and suddenly, you know, they're telling you they're having a heart attack. It's pretty common. People get amped up after having a heart attack, they freak out. You're not going to use nitro. Um, you have to question the patient about electro, uh, ele um, erectile dysfunction medication that they may have taken in the last 24 hours, both males and females. Important to know. Um, why? Because what happens with nitro is it increases the effect of other vessel, blood vessel dilators, which is what ED medication is. It dilates the, the vessels in your body. And in doing that, you're going to compound that effect with nitro. So um, really important to understand that because you will cause some serious immediate problems for that patient if they've had ED medication in the last 24 hours. The dosage is going to be zero. Uh, 0 0.3 or to 0 0.4 milligram tablet. The dosage will be on the prescription bottle or in the patient's prescription or 0 0.4 milligrams if it's a spray. Uh, either way, you're going to administer what that patient has been prescribed because you're assisting them typically. <coughs> it's going to always be sublingual. Sub so whether or not 
you're giving them a tablet or a spray, it's important for you to know you're going to ask them to lift their tongue, you're going to place the tablet under their tongue, or you're going to spray under their tongue. It goes under their tongue, uh, whether it's tablet or spray. Uh, we've already talked about what it does. It increases the dilation of the blood vessels. Um, they're going to probably get a headache, definitely going to get a burning sensation under their tongue. Um, you just got to, you know, if they, they're probably already familiar with it, chances are you're not giving them their first dosage. But, you know, it's something for you to know in case the person starts to complain they haven't seen this before. And, you know, it's part of a, a potential adverse effect uh, that, that's possible there. Their blood pressure could drop very, very quickly. So you need to monitor their blood pressure and signs of blood pressure, of hypotension. Uh, again, is this a stable patient? No. You're giving them medications. They're immediately unstable. You're going to assess them every five minutes. You're going to call for ALS. Again, chances are, not chances, good practice. Anytime you're administering medications, call for ALS. You're going to monitor their blood pressure, their heart rate, their level of consciousness, their respiratory rates. Right? You're giving a pretty serious medication here. They could have lied to you. They could be embarrassed to tell you they've taken ED medication, male or female. Um, so you could give them the medication, and suddenly you, um, you find that, oh man, you know, they're, they're deteriorating. What's going on? And you need to be able to take action, right? You need to be able to support their, their respirations. You need, they're going to probably crash on you is what's important for you to understand. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, glucose, typically I give this for hypoglycemia. Um, patient has to be able to maintain their own airway. If they cannot maintain an airway, you can't give them oral glucose. Now here's where, again, you need to be thinking one or two steps ahead. Um, you could have a patient that is <clears throat> seeming okay, they're hypoglycemic. Remember, their level of consciousness is going to be a little bit off. They're going to have a little bit of a challenge uh, thinking clearly. They might look a little bit spaced out. Your decision to give or not give glucose is, if I do this, is this patient going to suddenly just go unconscious on me? Um, you don't want something, especially a gel, caught in somebody's airway um, and, and go unconscious. So you need to figure out, you know, are they with it enough to do this? Can they handle this? Can they follow my commands? Um, you know, have you already got them on, on some supportive oxygen possibly? You know, are they showing signs of severe respiratory distress? Are they about to go into respiratory failure? Can they maintain that airway? These are things you need to think about, not just jam a glucose tube into somebody's cheek um, and start squirting away and then next thing within you you know you haven't even gotten the tube out and the person drops now if that happens what should you be thinking what do I do how do I get this out right how do I maintain their airway okay and and we're not going to go into that here but you need to start thinking about that with any medication my patient crashes what are my next steps so basically this is going to be done through a tube you're going to give small amounts. Uh, eventually, it's going to be either half or full tube that you give them, but you're going to give it to them in small uh, little squirts, right? You want to give them just enough that they can start getting this into their system. Um, and <clears throat> um, as they do that, um, you know, you're going to add to it. So you're not going to just jam an entire tube in there, which also, again, think about if the patient crashes, you don't want to give them so much that this is going to become a massive issue of how do you clear the gel out of their, their airway. Um, so could vomit, could have nausea from it. Um, again, patients got to be able to, to follow commands, a big one, especially when you're taking your test, you may be asked about this, right? So be really aware of, 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 of this, just not throwing glucose into somebody. Uh, oxygen, I'm not going to go deep into this. You should already know how you give oxygen, the leader flows, the oxygen rates, all of that information, um, what it's indicated for. Typically, if you're giving one of the other medications we just talked about, you're going to give oxygen as well. Chances, even if it's a, just a, a you know precautionary, giving them a nasal cannula and helping improve their oxygenation. There's very few times that improving oxygenation uh, is not a good thing to do, right? So just think about that as you're you're working through whether or not you give somebody medications. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about administration. <clears throat> These are the routes. I am not going to go into all these. You should already know these, but you also need to know not just what the different routes are and their definition, but their rate of absorption. Why do you need to know rate of absorption? So that you can monitor the patient. If you're giving somebody nitro, you're probably going to have an immediate um, 
um, response, right? So if you're not seeing that, you should be asking yourself, why am I not? I just gave this person nitro. It's not alleviating uh, <clears throat> the pain. Um, so what, what's going on, right? Uh, if you give somebody aspirin, um, right? So that's going to be oral. It's going to be a much slower response. Um, and, but you need to understand that the patient's not going to see an immediate improvement. It's going to take a little bit of time. Um, you know, we don't do IV and IO, so you just need to know what they are. You don't need to worry about doing them, but you need to know that it's an immediate um, absorption rate. So you need to know these. You should also know what the difference is between enteral and parenteral. Um, again, just stuff you need to know. I, it, it, you just got to memorize it and, and know it, and then I'll be able to apply it to each of your medications. <clears throat> Okay, the rights of medication or the nine rights or nine R <clears throat> is what you need to be thinking before you administer medication. Now here's a little trick. If you know everything I just gave you in the last section for each medication, the indications, the contraindications, the interactions, the adverse effects, the route, the dose, you will know all of this. You cannot do nine R without knowing everything I gave you in the last section. If you don't know the 10 things of each medication that we covered in the last section, for each medication, you cannot do the 9R. Impossible, okay? So you have to know those 10 things I gave you in the last section for each medication, then you can do the 9R. So what are the 9R? Simply stated, it's the right patient, right? Are you giving the medication to the right patient? And you may go, well, of course I am, it's the patient. What happens if you have multiple patients how are you confirming that this patient is the actual patient that should get this medication? Now, there's a few ways to do that, obviously. If it's the only patient, then yes, it's the only patient, but you should be able to state that. It's the only patient I'm interacting with. You possibly want to know their name, right? If you're going to compare them, <clears throat> their name to a medication uh, or a label, right? So you need to evaluate their what? Level of consciousness. They're, are they alert? Are they able to answer who they are, where they are? what's going on in the time. Um, is this the right medication? Have you really thought through the indication, uh, the indications and contraindications, the interactions, right? Have you thought about the adverse effects and the impacts? What are you expecting to get? So is this the right medication and the right indication? And there are no contraindications. Is this the right dose, right? Are you giving the right amount of medication for the indications you're observing? Is it the right route, right? Is this medication being given? The right way, you know. Are you are you are you you know giving somebody uh, aspirin and they're able to chew it, not swallow it? That's you know part of the route, right? Are they able to do that? <clears throat> the right time is the medication um, not expired, right? Uh, one thing I like to add to right time is is this the right time to give the medication? You know. A lot of times we're just trying to get through a test, but you need to understand in the real world, you know, if, if you have to give a medication, um, uh, you know, let's say you have to give oxygen or aspirin because your patient's showing uh, respiratory distress. Do you give the aspirin first or the oxygen first? Well, this goes back to, to the routes, uh, to the absorption rates. What's going to do the fastest help for that patient? Uh, so you need to think about that. So right time, yes, it's always and typically going to be um, you know, is the medication expired, right? Is the medication still valid? But you want to add to that, is this the right time to give the medication? Is there some other intervention I should be carrying out that's going to support that patient um, faster or not? Epinephrine, you know, is probably one where it trumps oxygen. You can get epinephrine into it because of an anaphylactic reaction. Um, you know, if somebody's <clears throat> having an anaphylactic reaction, a true ana multi-system anaphylactic reaction, and you can give them epinephrine, you probably want to do epinephrine before oxygen. Why? Well, if you understand how epinephrine works and what it's used for, you're going to understand that they're probably going to end up with an airway obstruction. So you can give them all the oxygen you want, but it's not going to ventilate, it's not going to ventilate, oxygenate, and improve respirations or perfusion, right? So you want to make sure that you get them that epinephrine first. So is this the right time to give the medication and is the education, um, you know, <clears throat> is it expired? Right education. Are you informing the patient of the adverse reactions, uh, the contraindications? Are you giving them information on what the adverse effects could be? Now, in most cases, you're going to do this rather quickly, but you do need to take time to let the patient know, hey, here's, here's what I'm going to give you. Here's why I'm giving it to you. 
uh, just to let you know there's some slight in, you know adverse effects that you could you could you could you know have from this <clears throat> um, what if your patient can't respond right what if they're starting to crash on you um, you have to make a judgment call right on the education patients always have the right to refuse you should know this from your medical legal side um, right response right evaluation you know beyond the indications and the dosage and the route this is probably one of the most important things to know. What are you looking for? We've covered this. What is it you're looking for once you give this medication? And I think you should know that before you give it, right? What am I hoping is going to happen in this patient if I give this? And then write documentation. Write documentation is writing down all the things that are in this list, right? Is basically you gave this patient this medication for this indication, this was the dose, this was the route, this was the time you gave it, um, the medication was not expired, you educated the patient on potential adverse effects and the reason for giving the medication, the patient did, did or did not refuse, right, if they refuse you still have to document it. Um, that's important to know, right, a lot of people are like, well if I didn't give it, why do I document it? Because Later on, it could be found that you should have gave that medication, and you need to be able to defend yourself and say, I did want to give it to him, and the patient said, I didn't know. I didn't want the epinephrine. Okay? <clears throat> or somebody has power of attorney and tells you, no, they don't want you giving Narcon to somebody. It's a pretty big one. Okay, so those are nine R. No easy way around it. you got to know these. But to know these, you have to know the medications and those ten things I told you about. Right? So that's why I presented those things first, and now we're doing this. Let's talk about medication administration workflow. Um, okay, w when we administer medication, there's a workflow we're going to go through. First, obviously, we're going to assess our patient. Uh, you may do a partial assessment or a full assessment, meaning you just do the primary, get your general impression, you decide this patient's going to need an aspirin, <clears throat> they need epinephrine, I see a multi-system anaphylactic reaction, and you're going to do that. Now, you may be talking to medical control. Maybe this is a young child that you want to give Narcon to, and Medical control says, go ahead and administer Narcon. So you're going to do something called ECHO. Anytime you talk to medical control, no matter what it is, even if it's not medications, and you're being given instructions, you know, transport patient immediately, um, whatever it is, uh, sit patient up, uh, place patient's legs up, whatever it is, um, change the flow rate on the oxygen, um, move to a non-rebreather. Uh, don't use a CPAP, use nasal cannula, uh, dual nasal cannula, or sorry, nasal cannula with a non-rebreather mask at high, high oxygen flow. Whatever medical control tells you, you repeat it back to them exactly and then ask for confirmation that that's what they want. That's called echo. It's just repeating back. You're echoing what you were told by medical control. You can also use this with others, right? Somebody else on your squad gives you a, a command and you echo it back to them. <clears throat> You're then going to do the nine rights when it comes to medication administration. Then you're gonna do a cross check. So in your mind, you've got the nine rights done. You now turn to your partner and you cross check. You advise them what you're going to do, what medication you're giving, for what reason, and what route and dosage. Then you're gonna actually give the medication. So this workflow has to occur before you give somebody a medication, okay? Basically, that's it. So what does cross check look like? Basically, if it's you, you're going to say, I'm going to administer 180 milligram, 81 milligram aspirin to the patient due to their ongoing chest pain, which is radiating to their left arm. This would be a total of 324 milligrams over the past 24 hours. The patient denies allergies to aspirin and is not on anticoagulants. I have informed them of medication effects route and how they can help. They have consented to the medication. Your partner is then going to say, you are administering 81 milligrams aspirin for chest pain radiating to the left arm. Total dose over 24 hours is 3 to 24, and they have no known allergies to aspirin. You then administer the patient the aspirin. You then tell your partner you administered aspirin at 1640. Patient seems to be tolerating it well. We should reevaluate in five minutes and also prepare to transport to meet ALS en route to the hospital. Your partner then responds, aspirin administered, 1640, tolerated, reevaluate in five, and prepare to transport and connect with ALS en route to the hospital. The point of this dialogue is that you're checking each other, you're cross-checking. I want you to also take notice here that the nine R's were respected in this communication. Now, you can make this a lot more optimal as you get better, but this is basically it. You want to communicate the nine R's to you, to yourself, and to your partner. They then confirm what you're doing. And while they're confirming it, one trick, make sure you're looking at whatever you're doing. If you're going to give somebody 81 milligrams, you are triple confirming that the medication you're giving to them is truly 
point uh, is, is 81 milligrams and that it's not an adult version of aspirin that is 325 and now you give that patient four 325 um, uh, tablets, right? That could be a, a pretty serious situation at that point, especially if the patient's on anticoagulants and you've now overdosed them on aspirin. So as you're doing this, you are triple checking you're giving the right dosage, okay? And that things aren't expired and it's the right time and then you're gonna reconfirm that the patient is able to, to actually accept this medication, right? So that's the cross check. Medication errors, slightly stated, you've made a mistake. There are a lot of reasons for this. The fastest one, the most important one that I don't have here on the slide is speed. You're so wrapped up in trying to give this patient a medication that you forget to slow it down a little bit, think about what you're doing, and go through those nine R's, right? Um, just takes a few seconds as you get better to go through the nine R's and make sure you have the right patient, the right indication. There's no contradiction, contraindications here. You understand what's going to happen, right? This is going to become second nature to you, right? So right now it may seem very slow, like, man, you're kidding me. I have somebody having through uh, an allergic reaction and you want me to slow down. The slow down is relative, right? But there's an old saying, uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, right? The way you get fast at things is you start out slowly and get better and better with them over time. <clears throat> One thing on medications, these are called never events. Uh, that's something we don't talk a lot about in the EMS world, but never events are things that should never happen, no matter what. And medication errors are never events. You should never, ever, for any reason, none, there is no defense for a medication error. This is why you need to know this stuff so well. Okay, terms and concepts. Uh, you can pause this. These are the terms you need to know for pharmacology to get through your test uh, and, and ultimately to have a, a great career in EMS. So pause this, make sure you know each one of these. I am not going to define these for you. You can go look them up. You need to go do the work, but you need to know, you need to know these concepts and terms. Some, and, and, and they're not just knowing the definition. So for example, you need to understand what an agonist is, right? Um, and, and what that means and what type of receptors uh, are stimulated um, by an agonist, okay? So, do the work. Okay, here's some scenarios for you. Quick one. And I'm not going to give you the answer to these <clears throat> because I want you to use your head. The answers to all of these are in the video we just did. But you should be able to work through each one of these. So you have a 36-year-old male who's complaining of chest pain and it started approximately two hours ago. Upon questioning, he advises that the pain is radiating to his left arm and back. The patient is not in respiratory distress. Well, what medications should you consider? Um, what are the indications and contraindications for that? What will those medications do to this patient if you give it to him? Um, <clears throat> what further questions would you want to ask this patient? There's not everything you need to know is in that little paragraph there. Some other things you need to know before you start administering medications to this patient. What would those questions be? Um, once you decide to administer medications, if you do, what's the workflow? What are you going to do? You're there with your partner. What are you going to do? Okay, so think about this. Pause the video. And think about it, right? Everything you need to know to answer this is in the video we just, in, the, in this video presentation. Second scenario, you encounter a nine-year-old child who's able to speak but answering questions slowly. The parent informs you the child is diabetic and that they haven't eaten since this morning. The current time is 1842. So again, what medication should you give? What further questions would you want to ask? What workflow would you employ? And now let's talk about what concerns would you have? What concerns would you have? This child is, is you know, um, diabetic. They're, they're not speaking well. What are you concerned about if you're going to administer medication? What are you going to watch for, observe, and make sure that if something happens, what's your plan of action going to be? Again, everything's in the video. So... If you didn't absorb it, go watch the video again. You're administering 481 milligram aspirin to a patient. As the patient places the aspirin into their mouth, you're distracted by a loud bang. Okay, when you refocus on the patient, you can't remember, did you give this patient four, three, or eight aspirins by accident? So what would you do? Um, what would be your immediate next steps? What would you advise your partner and other caregivers? Right, so it's really important that you think about this, right? When you transfer the patient, what are you gonna say? So again, think about it, everything's in the video. You've administered two doses of Narcon to a patient. 
suffering from an opiate overdose. The patient remains un unresponsive. They're not reacting to the Narcan. What do you do? How many more doses can you give? Um, and what's the interval between those doses? And what else should you be considering? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, a patient who you've given four aspirin to for a total of 324 milligrams, you should know what the individual aspirin dosage is at this point, uh, advises you that they also use nitroglycerin. They have a valid prescription and a bottle of nitroglycerin. What do you need to look for? What do you need to ask that patient? What are the potential contraindications? What are the adverse effects? What is the indication for giving this? Um, what are the things do you need to know, right? One of the things we didn't talk about is having a crash plan. One good thing that you can think about is always, what is my crash plan? If this patient crashes after I give this medication or carry out any intervention, what am I going to do? If I'm giving a patient oxygen, forget all the other medications for a moment, I'm just giving the patient oxygen, but they start to crash, what's my crash plan? Right? You should know in your head what is your crash plan for every patient. Okay, so you can write your answers down in the comments if you wish. The idea here is to get you to think and not for me to just walk you hand through and give you the answer. If you can think about these on your own, you're going to be much, much more powerful in, in, in not just being an EMT, but obviously in getting through your exams, both the written and the practical. Um, so with that, I hope this was helpful to you. Oh, actually, we got another one for you. Oh, here we go. Good bonus one. A patient who is allergic to peanuts is reporting hives along the arms, chest, and neck. The patient does not have respiratory <clears throat> or other distress at the moment. What do you need to do with this patient? What are you thinking? What would you want to observe for? What would you want to watch for? What would be the indications or contraindications on whatever action you take? How would you explain yourself in court if you took one action versus another? What's your crash plan? These are all things you need to start thinking about. And I'm hoping by now you're starting to get much easier and comfortable with this. If not, replay the video. Literally everything we covered in these scenarios is in the video. You can come up with other scenarios. In fact, in the comments, put down other scenarios so that other people watching this video can play around with scenarios, right, and, and start thinking. And so you, you know, help, help each other out. We're one community, right? Nobody's here to kind of try to stump anybody. So go ahead, put some scenarios that you've either seen, heard about, or just made up. Uh, that would ultimately require someone that's uh, an EMT to determine whether or not they would give medication. Um, and then for those of you studying, you know, go read those uh, scenarios in the comments and start thinking about how you would deal with those. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, you know, covered a lot of material, but this is the core information you need for pharmacology. As you go forward in your training programs, this is going to be a core part of what you need to do for every scenario you're given, whether it's in the written uh, or in the uh, skills testing. So you need to know this. There's no way that you can get past this. To do this, you also need to know medical terminology and anatomy, right? You can't get, you can't be really great at pharmacology without knowing those things, especially for the written exam. All right, with that, wish you the best of luck. Um, comment, please help each other out, put scenarios in there, put answers to the scenarios, um, pose these questions for each other, work together, one tribe, one community. Talk to you soon.